I fell in love with Russia when I first visited in the 1980s as a schoolboy. There was something epic about it. It was the Soviet Union then. Its government claimed to be leading humanity to a brighter future where all people would be equal. The changes since the fall of communism have been equally epic. Today, Moscow has more billionaires than any other city on the planet. But just as Russia seems to be catching its breath after all those changes, it turns out it's facing a hidden crisis. In the first six months of 2005, Russia's population fell by half a million. According to the government's own statistics, by 2050, it could lose up to half of its people. The trouble is that Russia combines a, a developed world birth rate with a third world mortality rate. Life expectancy here is 56 for men, which is the same as Bosnia or Bangladesh. And the rise in mortality here over the last 10 years is unprecedented in a developed country. It's as though the country is, is at war. The end of communism took away everything this country was supposed to stand for. Now a new nation is emerging. I wanted to see if I could find out what kind of place it's becoming and why its people are dying in such numbers. My search took me through Russia's least reported territories to see what's become of its citizens. My name is Boris Dobryakov. Welcome, Ivanova. Мы текстильный град. Нас называли русский Манчестер. When communism collapsed, it hit places like Ivanova particularly hard. The central planners had decreed that this would be the textile center of the whole Soviet Union. Now half the mills are closed, and two thirds of the population live on less than 60 pounds a month. The plan was that by brutalizing the economy in this way, you know, from 1991 onwards, having economic reform, throwing people out of work, that it would, a Darwinian process would occur where the fittest, the economically fittest would survive. Gradually, economic success would spread through the country and re-employ all the people who have been thrown out of work. Well, it's 15 years later, you know. Poland's now a member of the EU. And where's Russia? This place looks like it's... Uh, it looks like a bomb hit it in 1991 and everyone went away. For 70 years, the state employed and housed every citizen. It may not have provided freedom, but it offered its people a sense of direction. Most Russian people had become pretty skeptical about the promises of communism by the time it ended. But after 1991, tens of millions were abandoned to the most brutal effects of the free market. Astonishingly, the average life expectancy for a Russian man dropped by seven years. This is Moscow, once the HQ of the global class struggle, now capital of the Russian good life. The rest of the country has watched in disbelief. Vast fortunes have collected in the hands of a very few people. It may not be fair, but life here appears undeniably better than it used to be. Vladimir Panin is one of the success stories. In Soviet times, he was a doctor in accident and emergency. Now he's Moscow's biggest undertaker. His business has an official annual turnover of close to 100 million pounds. In 1987, when such a possibility was able to earn money, then it was decided to leave the business. В бизнес слово в то время не очень может быть понятное для всех россиян. Но во всяком случае оно уже было на слуху. Business in Russia soon came to mean a violent free-for-all, 
where the most successful had to ally themselves with a homegrown criminal mafia. There seems to be a kind of eternal Russian way of doing things which still obtains, you know, that... And the more you hear about it, the, there's constantly surprises that, that on the surface there have been these impressive changes and underneath there's a deep trough of corruption. Most Russians got left behind, while a handful of people with the right connections swallowed up state assets that once belonged to everyone. They became known as oligarchs, and Sergei Veremienko's one of them. I then learned that Veremienko has plans to use this land to make him even more money. He wants to turn these fields into a golf course and build a marina for rich people like him. But there are others who have lived here for years who are standing in the way of the project. We travelled to Krasnodar, on Russia's southern border, where we found the new nationalism is driving an entire nation into exile. Despite the country's dwindling population, the federal government has refused to recognise the Meshket Turks as Russian citizens. Soon there won't be any left. I'd been invited to a party being held by a Meshket who was leaving the next day for Buffalo, New York. I was astonished to find that the USA is taking all 30,000 of them and giving them American residence on humanitarian grounds. It's very strange. Russia desperately needs people, but not, apparently, these ones. Our conversation with the women was interrupted when some men in uniforms suddenly arrived. They said they'd been looking for us all over town and that we were in serious trouble. They wanted to see me and the producer outside. Kradar was a dangerous place, they said, and we needed their protection. And filming with the Turks was not allowed. It's really nasty, this, isn't it? He wanted us to get in his car and go and, and um, go somewhere unspecified with him. They said they were Cossacks, and from now on we had to do what they wanted. They told us the last journalists who refused their protection disappeared. They were found days later, decapitated, and left by the roadside. 